Okay. So I keep, try to keep you awake for the next hour or so. <laughs> uh, I would like to have one session now here where you can relax a bit more. Uh, I don't know how much uh, detail really I should go in. We will see that on the run. Uh, that is now something uh, where uh, the methodology is applied to uh, this premixed swirled flame that we have discussed uh, on Monday this week. So I've chosen that because it's good to come back to what we have seen before. Although the hybrid method has not been applied over here, this was the spectral fit still. So you might remember uh, that was this design where we have a swirling flame due to the fact that uh, we have this movable block design, a central bluff body with a complex recirculating flow where we have looked into this flame series and here I refer to uh, the case with a low Reynolds number of 10,000 and uh, slightly lean operation conditions with a thermal power of roughly 30 kilowatts, uh, which is uh, handable, although uh, very close to that flame, there is this uh, complex Raman detection scheme, which was then as well uh, extra cooled and conditioned. So for stable operation without any flashback, uh, this is an interesting uh, subject to study. Uh, to see what is happening in the flame fronts and so on, how this flame actually burns. And we have then performed uh, measurements at different axial positions and then uh, you have had this six millimeter line and this was then scanned through this region of interest. So this uh, extension is by far too much that you can uh, image that directly on the spectrometer. You can do that only piecewise. So from the delay line here, you see uh, the focusing lens giving rise to this probe volume. By that time, uh, we had a beam waste of 400 microns. We have reduced that now to something like 180 microns. Then you see here in the setup, uh, the imaging with these achromatic optics, uh, collecting as much photons as possible. So this is a, a custom fit design with uh, an F number of two, uh, with a working distance of uh, 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 I think 600 millimeters or something like that. So rather big optics. At the exit, the F number is fitted to the spectrometer. And this older design without having this fancy new spectrometer based on this trans transmission grading, by that time we have split off here uh, the Rayleigh and sent it to that to this camera. And this was by that time a commercial churn internal spectrometer with all its deficits in terms of um, uh, the transmission efficiency, so roughly 40%. So this was as well uh, a spectrometer uh, with the same specifications like with the transmission grading. So 300 millimeters, 1200 lines per millimeter grading. And then as well equipped with the mechanical shutter by that time 100 micro, uh, 10 microseconds gating, which is good enough for that flame. And then this UGRAF you have uh, seen uh, quite some times, you end up with a spectra like that, uh, which is then fitted with this quantum mechanical spectrum, including the background, from which then in the iterative procedure, um, just to remind you of that, you get then these seven scalars plus the temperature. And that can be used now um, to, to look what is happening along that uh, profile, single shots, yeah? single realizations. And uh, the signal from the Rayleigh was good enough uh, not only to uh, go here with sampling units in the th range of 300 microns, which is not really good enough to resolve flame fronts. Yeah? That's why we have uh, spent a lot of money and time to get that better. By that time, we were limited to 300 microns, but with Rayleigh, we could go down to 80 microns, which is uh, very good to, to uh, resolve flame structures. And then you find uh, in this rather low turbulent flame regions where you have more or less a constant temperature, you see here as well, some of the stripes have deficits that is unphysical, so not all is perfect here. You, in the unburned region, find something like that. Sometimes you hit the flame front, and uh, here's a laminar flame simulation. Uh, yeah, very similar to a laminar flame, but as well you find uh, structures within this few millimeters where you have a temperature drop, a temperature rise, due to turbulence and wrinkling. That is what you end up with. And so what I want to show is here only uh, some of the information. You see this here for an axial height of 10 millimeters above the bluff body. Uh, this is the radial direction for orientation. This is the bluff body over here with a symmetry line uh, at zero. And this is this annular slot. And this is uh, due to the construction of that flame or burner by that time and out of flange over here. 
And uh, the upper graph shows the temperature along with the RMS value shown in blue, and the lower one, the equivalence ratio, and eventually here, some mole fractions. And so if you refer to the inner recirculation zone, you see very interestingly here deviations from the adiabatic flame temperature, heat losses. Even 10 millimeters away from the, from the wall, uh, strong heat losses to the bluff body. The equivalence ratio is uh, around uh, 0.83. Nothing has been diluted, interestingly. If you go further out, you find a zone where you find the, in the mean temperature dropping and the RMS being at maximum. That is where the flame is flapping back and forth. Yeah, that is the so-called flame brush, where <coughs> still <coughs> there is no dilution by secondary air, and that is where, as well, the CO has its maximum. If we go further out, uh, now we are in location somewhere in the annular jet. There, uh, at 10 millimeters, nothing has yet reacted. It is, as well, still undiluted. Uh, and further out, uh, you find over here, uh, still no reaction. There is some fluctuation that because the flame, because of the outer flange, has as well a recirculation, and there is well some same uh, flame flapping. That's why in mean it's not so different, different, but there are some fluctuation levels. And you have here then the mixing zone between the annular jet flow pre-mixed with the outer um, uh, secondary air from the co-flow. And you can uh, do that now for different heights and you see what you expect. Uh, the temperature profile is radially now in larger positions. You find this effect of the outer recirculation zone and uh, the further downstream you get, the, the um, less steep the profiles, the mean profiles are uh, because of the dilution yeah, and, and spreading. Uh, you have typically these, um, uh, these uh, flame brushes, they, they open up. Yeah? The flame brush is simply getting thicker the further downstream you are. And at some location, maybe here, at not at 30 millimeters, at, uh, at 30 millimeters, it's maybe um, uh, still, well, let's see, the flame burns in regions where you not yet have had a lot of dilution of secondary air. If you go to 60 millimeters, then you end up in regions where secondary air has entrained and your local equivalence ratio uh, differs strongly. Okay. Maybe a few more things just to get an idea. These mean values and these variances are very interesting. But it's even more interesting to look now into so-called scatter plots. And that is the beauty of Raman Rayleigh spectroscopy. Now you can, and shown here is only a small fraction of the samples, you can now um, plot, for example, uh, mole fractions against the reaction progress variable like temperature. And here, this representation of the state space provides much more information. So at 10 millimeters, independent of where radially this data have been taken, you find um, uh, three regions where most of the samples are located. The region A means high temperatures, where all the methane went to zero, so most of that is consumed. And at 10 millimeters, where the equivalence ratio is still that from the feeding pipes from the nozzle. The region B over here, uh, that is where you have a low temperature, yeah, room temperature still, but a high level of CH4 at equivalence ratio of 0.83. And this means this is a cold, unburned fuel mixed uh, with air, of course. And the region C here, uh, the green dots over there, there is no methane there at ambient temperature, that is the secondary air. And then you can uh, nicely see these states in between. These are devoted to secondary air dilution because the equivalence ratio is changing from zero, uh, being pure air, to 0.83, being the mixture. And you find as well reaction without dilution, meaning at constant phi, you change the temperature and or up in this graph, you would see um, how the CH4 is consumed. Uh, any idea why, let's take that as an example, why you have a much smaller probability to find these samples during reaction? They, they're consumed faster. Yeah, but, but um, it's maybe not, not I would not, not completely satisfied by that answer. Of course, you have consumption, and that is, is, is a fast reaction. It's in the, in, the, in the right direction, the answer. Maybe you, you mean the correct thing. But what, what is then the, uh, the consequence if you have a fast reaction in terms of Sampling data with a certain uh, probe volume. It's a, thin flame. it's a thin flame. 
that is the, you meant that. It's a thin flame and that means uh, the probability to sample uh, in regions where the flame is thin is simply small. Yeah, you have the flame is doing that. Uh, let's say this is the flame brush and uh, where the flame spreads back and forth. And maybe this is as well the Raman measurement volume, but your flame is thin and always covers only a small fraction of that. And so most of the samples are either unburned or burned. Good. And so um, you can as well now uh, use this color coding to see where it primarily comes from. Maybe I should not go into all the details here. You can now locate the inner recirculation zone being mostly burnt at this height of 10 millimeters. And uh, yeah, clearly, if you're in the co-flow region CF, then you're, you're mostly uh, in regions where you have uh, uh, only secondary air. Uh, and uh, by that, you can as well uh, get the scatter plot linked to certain regions of your flow. And that provides much more insight than simply looking for mean and RMS values. You can do that um, as well now for different heights uh, at 30 millimeters, and now you see that the state space is completely <coughs> filled. And that is interesting to see. Um, you have here uh, regions that come into play where you have secondary air, man, uh, air entrainment into burnt exhaust gases, mixing between burnt gases and secondary air. You have still this uh, uh, reaction, but as well uh, more samples over here where you have uh, mixing between uh, burnt and unburnt fuel that can happen as well. Uh, but as well, you fill up this region over here and there you might have either mixing or extinction. And that cannot by this data yet been evaluated. In principle, you have these two cases. I guess it's primarily mixing because the uh, strain levels were not so high that the flame is locally extinguished. But Raman Rayleigh provides as well information about that. Yeah? Uh, if you refer to uh, the famous flame series from Sydney and Sandia, these flames A to, the, to F, uh, going uh, from D to F into uh, more and more extinction, you find uh, these data from Raman Rayleigh giving information about the, uh, these extinction events. Okay? So these scatter plots are the real beauty if you perform these local 1D measurements. And I have not shown any information about the gradients uh, that le leads too far. Um, but if you're interested in that, I can refer to papers um, from uh, Sandia, from Cambridge, from ourselves, um, which are provide a lot of information about these gradients as well. With that, I would like to conclude. We have seen um, with Raman and Rayleigh, you not only can measure temperature, but as well uh, the full thermokinetic state. Um, and that is a prerequisite to really understand what we call finite rate chemistry effects as well as pollutant formation. And this information is really crucial. You find uh, codes like fluent or so are benchmarks against such experiments. Yeah? That is, in the end, really, really, really important. And maybe we can skip the main findings because that was flame specific here. Uh, if you're really interested, I, I uh, sent around yesterday as well um, a more comprehensive review. If you're interested into that, you might uh, use the references inside there or read that chapters which are dealing with uh, Raman spectroscopy. Okay, with that, I would like to close that chapter unless you have questions. Yes, Chris. So the question is how to use that uh, technique in a opposed jet flame. So you have two possibilities um, where one is clearly preferred. Um, I have to put in a new transparency here. An opposed jet looks like that. One nozzle maybe with turbulence grid, the other nozzle, possibly with turbulence grid. One possibility, of course, is to send in the laser like that, but that's not very good because your, your flame, your turbulent flame is like that, and uh, then you have not only beam steering, the, the, re the interesting region uh, is uh, in this direction. And so um, I think it was only in Dagaya's dissertation uh, in my lab, he has uh, solved that problem. 
uh, by having here uh, a certain inlet with, with uh, uh, a tube going up to here, which was closed with the window. And then uh, uh, there was a mirror somewhere here. Actually, it came from the bottom. Uh, I was always afraid that he shoots away his eyes. Uh, uh, where you have had here a mirror, uh, that came then from the table, from the laser cluster, uh, brought down to the floor, and then with the mirror brought that up, somewhere with the uh, lens over here, such that the focus was in this region, and having then uh, the detection uh, from the side. Of course, along that uh, turbulent flame uh, located in the segregation floor. Not so sure about the beam steering, that can be an issue. But with that, um, uh, he was able, in his dissertation, to, to monitor then in this partially premixed flame as well scalar dissipation rates uh, along this, this direction. It's no fun. <laughs> but having the flame like this oriented, of course, is better because of buoyancy. If you would flip that, then, then it's not a symmetric flame. But then it would be much easier to send it through. But uh, there's no choice. You have to send the beam through the nozzles. Okay, then we uh, completely switch gears and uh, go to something which is uh, maybe more fun. Um, where is it? Ah. Because we, we can uh, watch movies. That is now about high speed uh, imaging. <coughs> and so already here you see that is linked to high-end high CMOS cameras, that is linked to uh, uh, not only spatial, but as well temporal resolution. What you see here is a very simple experiment. The engine is operated uh, in the intake as well with me uh, aerosols, uh, which are also me scattering particles, which are evaporating in, 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 uh, in a flame, such that you'd simply take a flame front from the evaporation uh, and that area where there's no me scattering is yellow and where you have me scattering is blue. And by that you can even in a master thesis um, come up with this kind of uh, flame propagation experiments. That works very reliably, yeah? So high speed in a certain sense is, is really fun. The drawback is um, you need as well a lot of material. It's expensive, but you don't need years uh, to be successful <laughs> like in Roman. So the question why high speed diagnostics and maybe for, for today, we can at least partly discuss the instrumentation. That might be interesting for, as well, uh, a number of you. So the first question, why high-speed diagnostics? We have seen that uh, with low sampling rates, a hertz, five hertz, maybe 100 hertz, you can uh, do very nice investigations as well from the flow and, and uh, the thermokinetic state uh, with reasonable precision and accuracy. But the effort is high but it's justified uh, when you are really interested in uh, single point statistics, maybe two point statistics, or in the example of the Rayleigh-Raman spectroscopy in scatter plots. I just want to remind what we just have seen. You get insights, uh, but you assume statistically stationary conditions, yeah? No transients. Then this is uh, very, very good and uh, very nice. If you're interested in things like that, uh, we have just discussed the opposed jet where you have extinction because you might have uh, very high strain rates. And I refer back to that video we have seen on, on Monday. This opposed jet flame where eventually uh, shown by chemoluminescence in the stagnation point, uh, the strain is so high that this local extinction goes over into global extinction. If you would use here a system with 10 hertz, you have no chance to resolve that. Yeah, you shoot in, you can't control that, that spontaneous event. You shoot when the laser shoots and maybe it's an interesting point and sometimes not. And you have no idea about the history. So all about high speed imaging is statistically dependent sampling. Get time histories, follow the time history and compare time histories. And you can do now better than uh, chemoluminescence imaging. We discussed PIV, uh, we discussed uh, uh, OHPLIF for flame front tracking. And this is now applied in a in a, in a system that has been part of a publication here, uh, 2009, uh, where Benjamin Böhm did, did his PhD on, uh, where you see here a PAV camera, two components, and you see a, a PLIF camera looking for uh, the flame propagation. And after post-processing, you end up with something like that. You have here this white area 
which is bounded uh, with the boundaries shown in black after post-processing. This is the flame. This was a flame where you have had uh, oxidizer against um, fuel, partially premixed. So this is in the stagnation plane, plane somewhere, your turbulent flame you've seen before in chemiluminescence. Now it's a cut, okay? It's, it's only a cut. And after post-processing, we are not interested more than knowing where the flame fronts are, yeah? And you see overlay to that the velocity field instantaneously, two components. And you see color-coded the vorticity. The vorticity is a, is a parameter giving rise to the angular momentum. So if it's deep blue or deep uh, red, then it's turning fast with strong angular momentum and colors which are not that dark, uh, then you have less vorticity. We have run this movie high speed during extinction you see first of all nothing happens the flame is uh, dancing around because of turbulence and now something happens now you see here a location where eddies seem to form up they align with a strong vorticity in this direction and in this direction and they are uh, uh, counteracting against pair of vorticities coming from the top and what you see is the effect the fluid flow is pressed strongly against the flame front. And that, might, uh, that poses a lot of strain on the flame somewhere here. And that can be now followed further in time. And now you have the situation where the flame cannot resist against this strain. And that means something like a rubber band. Uh, the flow field pulls this flame out. And that means um, in this region over here, uh, the flow field gives the reactions not sufficient time to release all the heat. It could. And thereby, less and less heat, heat is transported away, uh, new fluid is coming all the time very, very fastly, and then it's sometimes it's over, like blowing off a candle. That's the same. Now you can track that in space and time. And that's um, much more than, or a very different approach than statistically independent sampling looking for extinction. Now you can better understand what's going on. Yeah? Still, uh, after visualization, you have to do something with the data, and we come to that in a second. So high-speed imaging is always good if you uh, are interested in, in transient events like extinction, but for that as well, uh, you need a system that allows your post-event triggering. Because if you would decide now to take the data, maybe the next moment no extinction happens. So what you need is a system that continuously take the data, like a CMOS camera, then it happens, then you release the trigger and you save all the data before, let's say, over something like 100 milliseconds to achieve the full history. And that is now shown here uh, for a case where you see here times, zero milliseconds. That is uh, coming now to the point how to use the data. And that is something you, I think you really must go beyond just visualization. You must extract uh, the information out of that. And this is not so easy. And it is not generally answered. I just give you an idea, which I think is a very strong one, which is conditional statistics. So the idea is here to look for something which always appears with extinction. You have a breaching flame, there's a hole. You say whenever that appears first, you say this is time zero. Extinction defines time zero. And then you're interested in the times before, uh, over a couple of milliseconds. And you see here, three milliseconds before, nothing seems to appear. The flame seems to be the same thickness everywhere. But closer to that, 0.8 milliseconds, you already see the flame is thinned uh, due to the action of these uh, vertices that seem to interact with that flame. Looking for the strain, even maybe clearer, when, when you're too far from extinction, three milliseconds, too far, three milliseconds, not much. Um, there is nothing special about it, but then you, f you find areas where the strain shoots up. And that is as well for other realizations. Again, look for the strain. Here is where the flame breaches. There seems to be a build of the, st of the strain over milliseconds. Yeah? Now the question is, these are individual events. Now you come, need to somehow make statistics out of them. Because only that can be later on as well compared to large eddy simulations, for example. So that needs to be handled uh, to see this interaction of these vertices that act coherently somehow with a flame and impose a high strain rate. And one possibility is now that you do the following. The extinction in your field of view happens at different locations. So what you do is you transform the coordinates such that all these samples are 
located with the extinction at the same place. Yeah? You shift them radially and axially such that the extinction always is the same place. If you do that, then you can, can um, average them and, for example, get an average flame front, shown in black, and an average field of vorticity or 2D strain, which I can decompose into compressive and extensive strain. And now follow the time history and doing that for selected points. Of course, by visual inspection, you see here's something happening. There's strain. Let's take this monitor point. Or let's take this monitor point where always you have a strong vorticity. And then plot uh, at these monitor points, averaged over a certain region, uh, the time history. Time zero, as I said, extinction. And we take the time before that. And then you see uh, monitor point number one, how the strain builds up over something like three to four milliseconds and then reaches a plateau and then still needs something like a millisecond or so, one and a half millisecond, until the flame actually is ex extinguished. And that's very interesting because now we have a lot of information in here. If you strain the flame strongly for a very short period, the flame will survive. You need to strain the flames over a long time, milliseconds. Why? Because in the end, you need the transport, diffusion of radicals, diffusion of heat. And that is in the millisecond regime for these conditions. Yeah? And that's why uh, you now see uh, these long, uh, rather long times that are needed to finally blow off the flame. And that cannot be taken by Raman. No chance. You need something which is giving images, which resolves that. You need something which uh, provides you a reference frame because the lab coordinates are a not good coordinate system. Like in flame theory, very often you refer to the flame itself. So qualitative OHPLIF gives you a reference flame. That's very helpful. It's qualitative, not quantitative. But you use it for this conditional averaging. And uh, there you see uh, you can make use out of uh, a qualitative high-speed imaging technique in combination with the flow field. Multi-parameter. Again, looking just for one parameter, and you cannot come up with something like that. You have to combine it. And that uh, is uh, maybe uh, good enough uh, as a reason to say that we spend a lot of money into that to actually come up with, in that case, it was conditional velocities, meaning that in the end, you switch from lab coordinates to flame fixed coordinates. That's the essence. Yeah? That's the important part. And thereby, you deconvolute the effects you're after from the intermittency. Yeah? And that is uh, what I mean by conditional velocities. We have written a your review article six years ago where this idea is, is uh, described in more detail. And in the lecture notes uh, distributed yesterday, you would find the references. OK, and this is just repeating what we have seen before. So uh, it's not only extinction. Uh, Reignition could be as well a phenomenon that you can investigate by that. Flame stabilization, flame propagation, flashback, uh, auto ignition, spark ignition, cyclic variations, and of course, you can as well use high speed diagnostics to get it 4D, volumetrically and in time. Okay, so what kind of instruments you need? Of course, uh, if you're after a certain phenomenon, you have to now um, convince your um, funding agency somehow to spend uh, half a million and that should, should be justified. Uh, so what repetition rate is needed? We refer back to this uh, premixed swirling flame uh, where you see now here flame fronts in the flame brush. Uh, this is a Reynolds 10,000 only where we have obtained this Raman measurements. Yeah? You see how uh, wrinkled that flame already appears uh, at 10,000 Reynolds number. Uh, we have seen the integral time scale uh, can be estimated based on um, LDV measurements, for example, um, such that you have here uh, something like a millisecond. Then you say to discretize uh, this integral time scale, maybe with a factor of uh, uh, 10 samples within that time scale, you end up with 100 microseconds or 10 kilohertz. And to convince yourself, these are the same data to the left and the right. To the left, only every second is played. To the right, each frame is played. And um, here you see by inspection, uh, by eye, the correlation is maybe sometimes possible, but not as good uh, as if higher rape rate there. By eye, your brain is a good uh, cross-correlator. Uh, you find everything moves smoothly. 
So that is, of course, one possibility. Run that movies and inspect whether uh, they are smooth or not. You can do that as well in the engine. Here example uh, where we have operated the engine at 1,000 RPM, did PIV, two component. Uh, we resolved that with a crank angle degree uh, corresponding to six kilohertz. And now we go through the full cycle without combustion. Um, but I like that movie, intake stroke. It's very fast, yeah, it's not correlated. This is crank angle resolution. And if you inspect that by eye, you would uh, maybe agree that it's not really correlated. Now we come to the compression stroke. Everything is getting uh, uh, slower and slower. And we switch eventually then to larger. No, it's, it's still every crank angle. You can follow by eye. Now the compression is over. Now we have the expansion. Still everything seems to be okay in the correlation. Now we eventually open the exhaust valve somewhere now and everything again not correlated. Now you can see in a tumble plane here nicely with a certain resolution the velocity magnitude and the directions uh, uh, as given by this two component PIV. Again for some regions you would say a crank angle is sufficient to resolve that in others like the intake open or exhaust open it would not be. How can we do that better? Uh, well, we, we, can, we can go uh, more thoroughly, more systematic, uh, and I would like to exemplify that with this, uh, again, premixed swirling flame that as well is uh, in some cases operated without any combustion. Uh, you see the complexity of the flow without any combustion visualized here by also pressure surfaces. Uh, by the way, these are um, processing vertices in the swirling flows, very interesting. Uh, unfortunately, you have no time to go into more detail. However, they, they provide you a complex flow field where by LDV time series, for example, for a different Reynolds number, uh, 10 or 40,000, you find here the uh, temporal order covariance. As I explained, you take the, uh, oh, well, uh, the area, you take this area, and this area is then a measure for the integral time scale. You end up with for 10,000 with a millisecond, as already discussed. And uh, according to the nyquist chenin theorem, um, that's the minimum you need is uh, uh, at least two samples to resolve that, meaning 2,000 frames per second. Look for specifications of CMOS cameras, no problem, uh, they are faster. It's more critical if you go to the small scales. Uh, we have as well discussed that earlier this week. Um, where based on the turbulent kinetic energy, the integral length scale, you estimate the dissipation, assuming homogeneous isotropic turbulence with the viscosity, you end up with a Kolmogorov time scale uh, with a 100 microseconds, let's say, as a, as a good estimate for that case. According to the nyquist shannon theorem, that ends up already with 20,000 frames per second, 20 kilohertz. That's doable. CMOS cameras with a full, um, full frame can go up to 25 kilohertz, something like that, nowadays. <coughs> they can go up to a megahertz, but then the region of interest, the number of active pixels is uh, decreasing dramatically. However, that seems to be possible. But now we come to a very important point, and that is, uh, at least I have no, 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 I'm not sure whether this is published yet. Um, you have an interdependency between time and length scales. And that needs to be considered. And so let's say you have here your object plane where you do your PIV or uh, LIF or whatever uh, with a certain uh, lens system. You bring that into the image plane on the CCD and you have a certain uh, magnification. And this magnification links your, uh, these delta X values, the smallest uh, things that can be discretized to uh, the co corresponding pixel size given on your object plane. And so according again to the nicholas shannon theory, you would say the limiting um, length that can be resolved in the object plane is two delta x, yeah? maybe in only in one direction. The same would hold true, of course, in the vertical direction. Um, and then without any proof, there is a relation between the spatial dynamic range. What is it? That is the largest scale, which is the field of view, divided by the smallest scale that can be resolved according to that theorem which is here the limiting uh, um, length. To give you an idea, oh, do you know what that would be for a, uh, a, an image sensor, thousand by thousand pixels? Thousand pixels divided by two pixels, 
to give you an order of magnitude, this is only 500. Yeah? And now we come to the, the key point of this transparency. That is linked to the temporal resolution over the pixel rate. The pixel rate is something which is given, or a, a parameter of a given CMOS camera. Yeah? That is, of course, technology developed. The number became better and better, but it's still a limited number. Meaning, if you do want to have a better temporal resolution, meaning make tau limits smaller, then with this square root dependency and this pixel rate as a parameter, uh, the spatial dynamic range will getting smaller. Yeah? So better temporal resolution at some stage uh, will cause a, a worsened spa uh, spatial dynamic range. Of course, you still can look for fine structures by a higher magnification, losing signal, of course, or um, uh, that is still doable, but then uh, you cannot look at the smallest scale simultaneously with rather large scales. So uh, that is what you should keep in mind from here, that this interconnection between spatial and temporal resolution is um, uh, given by a parameter which is called pixel rate, which actually is nothing else than the readout rate of your CMOS camera. And uh, this is technology from one and a half years ago. You have 20 to the uh, 10 to the 9 pixels per second that can be read out. Let's take a magnification of 1. Let's take um, a Kolmogorov scale of 100 microseconds that you want to resolve. Let's take a field of view, a typical number, 20 millimeters, and consider that your spatial dynamic range, as I just said, is in the order of a thou uh, 500 if you have 1,000 by 1,000 pixels. And then you resolve the for the limit uh, length scale and you end up with 40 microns. And then you compare that with your Kolmogorov length for that flame here again, 50 microns, same order of magnitude, meaning that you can resolve the Kolmogorov scales, including a field of view of 20 millimeters, which is roughly, let's say, two to five integral length scales, which is good. So for Reynolds 10,000, you're fine. You can resolve the smallest and the largest structures simultaneously in principle. Yeah? by at least not limited by the, by the uh, rep rate of your camera and the readout rate of a camera. Maybe you're limited by your spatial resolution of the optics, possibly. Yeah? It's not, that is not the, the, uh, the topic here. However, 10,000 is not much. If you, if you go to the NASA or to DLR, they are interested in numbers of 10,000, uh, 100,000 or more, then you reach very, very fast in the limits. And that is uh, visualized here. Uh, what you see is this interdependency frequency over length. And now I fill that box. Uh, we have a dynamic range in space, as I said, roughly 500. I can define as well uh, a dynamic, dynamic range in time. Where is that coming from? That is the measurement time, which is limited on the CMOS. Because you have an onboard memory. You cannot store more than a certain number of images. And with a given rep rate, uh, that fills up maybe in a second or so. Then you have your Kolmogorov time scales you want to resolve together with the nyquist shannon theorem that kicks in this two with a frame rate. And for, again, technology maybe one and a half years old uh, with an onboard memory, I forgot that, was it 32 gigabytes or so? You end up with a, a temporal uh, dynamic range, which is four orders of magnitude, 10,000. More than uh, one order of magnitude better than the spatial one. And this is here shown for uh, a magnification of one. The maximum pixel rate, uh, readout rate, oh, sorry, the maximum frame rate is maybe 25 kilohertz uh, for that uh, current technology. So up to that, you can, you can shift your box. You lose something here, of course, if you shift that up. So the really long uh, time scales are not covered anymore. If you go further up, what would happen? If you want to get faster, then this red area would shrink. Or you change the magnification and you can shift your box. So this kind of, let's say, uh, uh, estimations should be done before you do the experiments to really see whether you're able to resolve what your question is. Without that, uh, uh, let's say, pre-investigation as a reviewer, I would, I would not allow that uh, project to go, yeah? because you have to show that it's working. OK, examples where this high-speed diagnostic is really important. 
it's not only transients that, that are to be discussed. Uh, already mentioned them, I don't have to repeat them. It is well those applications where you can afford only a few realizations. Uh, like shock tubes. Uh, well, there are as well developments to, to fire shock tubes faster, but many shock tubes can be operated only, let's say, a couple of times per day. And then, of course, you're interested to get as much data as possible. Or uh, when I refer back to this gas turbine combustor we're looking at, PIV, seeding particles going in, solid seeding, the, the optical windows are covered within a couple of seconds. 10 hertz PAV, oh gosh, no. High speed PAV, that's not the, the uh, correlation you're maybe after. There is getting as much data as possible until you have to re uh, uh, open the system, clean the system, and uh, redo the experiments. The transients, I think, are clear. So, um, but as well, uh, very nice uh, if you have these high rep rates. In principle, you can do then something like quasi 4D diagnostics. And that is as well a topic uh, to be discussed. Uh, uh, then uh, tomorrow where high-speed lasers and cameras are, are interesting. And so uh, you have seen that already. Here are some reviews as well in these lecture notes uh, we provided to you uh, where you can read uh, more about as well uh, this conditional averaging which is in, in our review article in flow turbines and combustion. So we now should have a closer look into the requirements of the lasers. And that's maybe something we still can do uh, today. You have different options about high power lasers uh, with high rep rates. So they can be classified into systems where you have a low duty cycle, but high pulse energies. A low duty cycle means that maybe only every second you can extract a number of pulses. Um, it's maybe not the first group, but uh, at least that came to my mind when I prepared the transparencies. Marco Zaldin, 20 years back in Lund, uh, in Sweden, was uh, one of the uh, first who used a cluster of four conventional YEG lasers, similar to what we still use in Raman, uh, frequency doubled and extracted up to eight pulses with up to 500 millijoule per pulse. And then using either harmonics, let's say the, third, uh, the, the fourth harmonic, or pumping a dye laser, he was uh, providing a user facility uh, as well, um, uh, in that time, I used that because we had not such equipment. And we brought our ignition cell down there. This was a huge cell equipped with vans uh, to uh, fans to create turbulence, ignite premixture here, and then get these beautiful OH plif images where you can see, starting from a spherical kernel, how turbulence interacts and disrupts that flames, extinguishes that flames. So really fun to look at. So that was. Uh, this uh, uh, Lund user facility. That developed enormously. Uh, so that was started actually, I think, here in Princeton and then was uh, taken over uh, by uh, Walter Lampert uh, uh, initially to the Ohio State and then taken over by Jeff Sutton. Uh, they came up with a laser system that is, uh, yeah, really cool. They, they create starting here, uh, where is it, uh, from a, um, from a continuous laser, they, they create a pulse burst, and then they use uh, a huge amount of amplifiers uh, with um, uh, many amplification steps and bring then uh, uh, pulse bursts out uh, up to 100 here at 50 kilohertz in this publication, where you see here the pulse energy um, uh, at 10 kilohertz, at 20, 20 kilohertz after frequency doubling, which is enormously high yeah, and rather reproducible. So a system, when you need these pulse bursts with high energy, you, you can do better than this four to eight from these uh, lasers which are fired sequentially. That is a completely different laser concept and they have used it as well for temperature imaging based on really uh, images shown over here. This was a, a, a jet flame from the DLR, a standard flame that is used in the TNF workshop and you see here these numbers separated uh, frames by 100 microseconds, yeah, 10 kilohertz. 10 kilohertz planar Rayleigh, that's, that's really cool. Yeah? It's, uh, of course, you have to, go to ask now what to do with the data, but on their own, that's beautiful, I think. Look at the signal to noise, that's great. Yeah? Of course, there's some post-processing for sure. I forgot that details, I have to read the paper again. But you see, um, 
uh, here's the temperature scale, and you see now by R you can follow all these structures. Uh, very uh, good laser, and uh, they um, commercialized. You can get it commercially as well. The other end is a system with low pulse energy, but a high duty cycle, continuously, uh, continuously extracting or, or, or emitting these pulses. And there, <coughs> in this kind of uh, high speed lasers, again, you have two options. One option is long, pul long pulse lasers, typically more than 100 nanoseconds, where because of the long pulses, the intensities are low. That's why you need an intracavity conversion uh, of, uh, from the infrared to the visible to the UV. Yeah, that is intracavity. And thereby, you have less flexibility. Uh, another sort of lasers is uh, working with, um, with uh, short pulses where the intensities, although the energy is low, uh, you can uh, do the extra cavity conversion into the visible or and then as well UV. And those with the short pulses having high intensities are good for pumping dye lasers and then as well converting this dye laser radiation uh, down to the UV. And you find here uh, that is now as well a couple of years old, uh, but that has been done um, in a cooperation between a German company and uh, um, a group here in the US they extracted five 50 kilohertz dye laser, uh, no, and this was a pump laser, 50 kilohertz, 200 watt, pumping a pure dye laser, and then uh, achieving something like seven, uh, seven watt at 283. That's a lot of energy in the UV, and they did some uh, demonstration experiments uh, in a flame here, a plasma torch stabilized methane air flame, where now the, the, the frame to frame separation, 50 kilohertz, where is it? 50 kilohertz is 20 microseconds. Again, that's a cool experiment. Of course, you have to ask yourself what to do with the data. And I refer back to the conditional sampling. Yeah? Combine that, for example, with PIV for high-speed processes, and you can learn a lot. Only a single parameter might be good to show something, but explaining something needs typically more. OK, what's about the camera side? It started with multi-frame CCD cameras. Different suppliers I have only one uh, example here, one of the first from Princeton Scientific Instruments, where they were able to, uh, at 14 bit, it's of course questionable whether, whether we need that here, uh, 28 frames uh, with a limited number of pixels, but three megahertz. So for certain applications, a very, very good instrument. Uh, the other option is, and that is why I, I just show here some more details, is the CMOS cameras. Yeah, the CMOS cameras where you have uh, in, in, in difference to the CCD. In CCD, you read out pixel by pixel. That's a serial process. In CMOS, you do that parallel. That's why it's so much faster. And uh, recent technology allows you full frame, roughly 1,000 by 1,000 pixels, with 25 kilohertz. You can operate that as well faster, a megahertz, but pixel rate is limited. The readout rate is limited. That's why the number of active pixel goes down when you crank up the rep rate. OK, and then you can store thousands of frames, which is only limited on the onboard memory. And that's expensive. Yeah? And so you have to decide before whether you want to have 32, 64 gigabytes, because sending the camera back and increase that memory is more expensive than uh, directly buying it. Examples, not only Phantom, I should be careful here, as well Photron uh, provides uh, similar instruments, or uh, a company in Munich uh, called PCO. But uh, you have to be careful when you use these CMOS cameras. And that is something I would like to um, uh, briefly explain uh, before we uh, have then a break with lunch. Um, first of all, CMOS cameras have been the primary market, for example, in crash tests. Yeah? And so they are just used to visualize things. They are not scientific instruments primarily where you have full control, for example, over the chip temperature. Typically, these instruments have no cooled chip. And if you now have a certain illumination, which is kept constant with an orbit sphere, for example, and do that with a certain illumination uh, here with 100 milliwatts per square meter in stereoiont or without any illumination, you would find that for, a certain, for all pixels, but uh, differently, that the gray value, that's the intensity, that was, I think, a 12-bit system between 0 and 4,000-something counts, uh, you find that over the time, um, the system warms up, and uh, the output is not constant. 
So the advice, advice is you should wait for thermal equilibrium that takes a couple of hours. Maybe you don't switch off the camera overnight if you're allowed. <laughs> you have to decide. Then um, typically these cameras come with uh, a so-called um, uh, intensity calibration. So the first time we operated the system, uh, I was so astonished, we looked for OH, that in regions where no flame was, it was dark, there was no noise. How can that be? What they do, they shift simply everything slightly to the left such that you cannot have a gray value lower than zero. You truncate the noise. Yeah, you shouldn't do that. Then you do not know exactly where you have your zero. So my advice is not possible for all cameras, but switch off the intensity, intensity calibration such that even if there is no illumination, you cover the lens, that your dark uh, noise is in, uh, distributed somewhere where you see then the PDF uh, fully with maybe uh, uh, the mean value is somewhere, it depends on the camera of course, on the noise, uh, clearly uh, on the, on the right-hand side. Okay, this is shown over here. Now, uh, this intensity calibration has been turned off and your, your, your dark uh, uh, noise distribution is now for positive values, that's okay. But now inspecting these PDFs over here, or these histograms, uh, here are holes. Yeah, strange. They, they, they wouldn't tell you, yeah? Although you buy a camera with uh, zero to 4,000 um, discretization levels of your amplitude, you find these holes inside there and you can't remove them. Just be aware of that. That depends on the instrument and I have not looked in the most recent technology. This is uh, maybe now uh, seven, eight years old, but um, that, that seemed to be happened over here that the, these holes are never filled. You never have a, a gray value here with, what is that? Uh, with, with three. You never observed a gray value with 11. And that reduces your dynamic range. And thereby you have a larger digitization noise. So although you think you have 12 bits bought, you get less. Okay. Then these cameras are, uh, must be uh, calibrated pixel-wise. Using a homogeneous calibrated light source is one possibility um, because they are non-linear to a certain extent at least. Um, for reasons that are used in that community, you see here uh, a camera model. Uh, for a given pixel i, you see here the gray value starting from an offset of that pixel. Uh, you see here then a, a, a dependency with the number uh, of electrons that are uh, uh, generated by, by the absorption of the photon. Yeah? This is the inner electrical photoelectrical effect such that you have here created a number of photons and in the ideal world you would have here a scaling constant, a k value which is given for a certain pixel which is a constant. But if you now increase your uh, illumination intensity and look for certain pixels given here from that C CMOS camera, you find that this factor k is not a constant. It's changing yeah, here by five, six percent depending on the pixel. So whenever you make a measurement quantitatively and want to use the intensity in a linear fashion directly, let's say, to a concentration, that doesn't work. You need to, to calibrate that uh, against uh, this nonlinearity. And that is, I refer back to thermographic phosphor imaging, where you want to measure the de decay time, and the decay time uh, presumes a linear response of your detector, and that means each of the pixels has been corrected for this nonlinearity. And if you have a million pixel, uh, as I said yesterday, that might be computationally uh, challenging, but of course it's doable. So you do have here uh, linearity, at least for this instrument, in the order of uh, roughly up to uh, nonlinearity up to 6%. And now I want to uh, uh, say something about intensifiers, because very often we have to, oh, there's a question. Yeah, so these uh, conversion factors change according to temperature as well? Uh, the, the question is whether these conversion factors change with temperature. I don't remember that. For sure we have investigated that. I have to either look up in the paper or look in the, in the lab book. I think we have done these experiments after the CMOS has been warmed up for four hours. And so maybe you have better look into that. And so um, what I recommend is once you have, you have uh, come up with, with certain uh, 
yeah, well, peculiarities of your system, uh, you always should follow then a, 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 a startup procedure, which is every day the same, to be sure that at least from that uh, you have reproducible um, conditions. At least when you do something quantitatively. If you do it qualitatively, then it's not so important. Image intensifiers, because uh, you have typically low pulse energies, uh, the intensifiers are built out of two stages, uh, an MCP and a so-called booster. And then the nonlinearity is increased significantly. I don't recommend to do that too often with your image intensifier because it, it will kill it. It has a certain lifetime only. If you now take an Ulbricht sphere, for example, shine into the uh, intensifier, you would do that only for a couple of times and then your intensifier is dead. So you better do that with a company paying for it. Um, uh, here you see again the same experiment. Irradiance has been increased uh, for the full uh, frame and the conversion factor for these pixels again, they changed by 20%. So that's, that's huge. So that already points towards the fact uh, making quantitative measurements with a two-stage intensifier is tricky. Even more bad is uh, the following. If you now operate the system here at five kilohertz, for example, and increase now the illumination uh, intensity, these are gray values uh, from 1100 to 3100, and you follow up here the, for certain values of your pixels, um, you look up, these are normalized to one over here, over time. These are frame numbers from, shown from zero to 5,000 frames. Everything has been kept constant. Yeah? The illumination has been kept constant. And what happens is that uh, the signal extracted from the system is getting lower and lower. And that is even worse the, the higher your signal levels are. And that is due to the fact that in these intensifiers, um, you do have uh, the light coming in, it's transferred to electrons, and the MCP, the amplification, makes out of one electron many electrons. They must come somewhere from, so that you feed in electrons by a current into the MCP and the booster, and uh, eventually uh, the feed rate of the electrons is, is not, not high enough. And that means uh, you find then somewhere in equilibrium, but if you take data, for example, between uh, frame number 500 and 1000, you have a drop in intensity by a couple of percent, uh, and you think maybe you're, that's due to a process. It's simply due to bleaching of your MCP. You have a question? So do you see this behavior uh, only in continuous running, or when you just run for this many uh, cycles and then you shut down the camera and the next thing you come to the the, OK, the question is whether you see this only if you run this continuously. Yes. Uh, uh, yes, if you, if you operate the system, maybe take 4,000 frames and wait for a minute, you will start again there. Maybe eventually your uh, MCP or booster has degraded, that might happen if you do it too, too long. So overall, then the sensitivity drops until uh, the system doesn't work anymore. But uh, that is only when you operate it continuously. And the same holds true here if you have a constant illumination intensity but crank up the uh, repetition rate uh, for this constant illumination from 5 to 30 kilohertz you see the same. And so that is uh, something that needs to be um, considered uh, and of course is getting worse when you have a lot of signal. Yeah? If you don't, if you have, let's, for example, you make, if that would happen, uh, CH lift and you have information only in a small stripe and the rest is black, then it's not a problem. But if you look for chemiluminescence or when you look for OH lift where potentially a lot of the uh, image is covered by high intensities, then it can be, uh, make, a, make a difference. And that's why for uh, those reasons, um, some of the experiments as well in my lab uh, are operated such that we use the data only after uh, at least 2,000 frames have been taken. So we don't take the information then from the first 2,000 frames until we have reached dependent on the, on the level, something like a plateau, uh, where then the changes are not so strong anymore. And so it's, of course, difficult to account for that because it depends on the signal intensity, the frame rate as shown over here, the exposure time not shown, the illuminated area. And so in the end, you need something like an in-situ calibration. Yeah? You have just be aware of that fact. Yeah, what is now uh, to be pre preferred? We had that uh, early on in discussion here as well. Whenever possible, uh, use an unintensified CMOS camera. Then, 
once you have switched off this uh, intensity calibration, once you have corrected for the nonlinearity, you can come down to a noise level of percent, which is acceptable for many applications. If you do the same for an intensified CMOS camera with these two-stage intensifiers, even if you have corrected for the nonlinearity, uh, even if you are aware of the fact that there is signal depletion, uh, I don't have a back best practice advice here how to do that. Even, even you, if you do that, you end up at best with something like four to five percent. It's still, for many applications, good enough to say this is quantitative, but it's limited. And what I have not discussed is that these intensifiers always come along with halos. Yeah, if you have a spot illuminated, let's say you have a sharp edge, in reality, in, in practice, you will see something which is blurred like that. It's something you cannot prevent. And I call that halos, and uh, those uh, change your, your, um, your contrast. So how to deal with that, I don't know. <laughs> really, each CMOS camera might act differently. Intensifiers are differently. They change their properties with lifetime. So actually, we would need something like a best practice advice. But uh, there is a group in Europe working on that and from different institutions. But they came up with some advice, but it's not really, not really usable for us. It is more for industrial imaging and less for uh, the needs we have in combustion diagnostics. So still, I would say that is open ground to a certain extent, although it's difficult to find funding if you're working in the field of combustion. That is something we try to do on the site. Yeah, with that, um, I would like to close that chapter 8A. So we have for tomorrow morning, then uh, chapter 8B, which is a bit more fun in terms of videos. And uh, then you'll see as well the application example. So in case you have any questions, uh, maybe we have time for one or two of them. I expected that, you're hungry? <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. <laughs>